Initial Stabilization of Shock I'm Jim Lavelle. I'm an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. And the next thing we're going to tackle in this course is what to do once you've recognized your patient is in shock and how to stabilize them. We treat evaluation and stabilization as if they are two completely separate processes, but in truth, they happen in parallel. We'll talk about things here in a sequence, but we're really doing most of these things all at once. It can get frantic and chaotic, but that's not uncommon in the ICU. It's really important to have the knowledge and cognitive framework in place in order to confidently and competently guide the management of patients in shock. Before we start, it's important to think about each shock state in terms of the primary pathophysiology, as we'll exploit that knowledge to develop treatment strategies to address the physiologic defects. Hypovolemic shock results from loss of circulating blood volume and is thus a preload problem. Distributive shock results from inappropriate vasodilation and is thus an afterload problem. Cardiogenic shock results from reduced contractility and is thus an inotropy problem. Extracardiac obstructive shock is variable, but most causes affect the right heart, which is very preload sensitive. So you can think of this as a preload problem as well. To give or not to give. What a question. Fluid resuscitation and shock is a hot topic, and it's been one of some degree of debate for my entire career. In most cases, fluid resuscitation is necessary in shock, but how much and what kind and for how long remain uncertain. We won't delve into any great details of the previous and ongoing studies here, but I expect standards of care to change slightly in the coming years. What I don't expect to change is the general thought process of who should and who should not get fluid. The first line treatment for hypovolemic shock is always going to be fluid, so that one's easy. Similarly, we're always going to give at least a 30 milliliter per kilogram fluid bolus to patients in septic shock, and I think it's reasonable to generalize that to all distributive shock. In distributive shock, the whole vasculature, not just the arterial side, dilates, so the potential venous volume can expand dramatically. Most cases of obstructive shock should get fluid particularly those that affect the right heart, tension physiology, tamponade, and pulmonary embolism. Instruction to left ventricular outflow is pretty rare, but in some cases of aortic or mitral valve pathology, fluid can hurt. In these cases, you're going to get experts involved in a hurry, so you're probably still okay starting fluid in every patient that you think has obstructive shock. Cardiogenic shock is a challenge. As you saw in our example, Almost anything goes in cardiogenic shock due to myocardial infarction. The patient can have any volume status at the outset. Vasopressors will raise the blood pressure, but will also increase myocardial workload. Inotropes will increase the cardiac output, but will also increase myocardial oxygen demand and might actually lower the blood pressure. This is why you need an expert involved early. In cases of cardiogenic shock due to decompensated chronic heart failure, this is a pretty clear place where giving fluid is not a great idea. Let's talk about some treatment-specific measures next. Hypovolemic shock is easy. Lose volume, give volume back. Get a couple of large bore IVs in and give a liter or two of crystalloid. If a hemorrhagic etiology is suspected, it's important to ensure that coagulation studies and platelets are okay. A good rule of thumb is to keep the INR less than 2.0 and platelets greater than 50. You will likely need some packed red cells as well. Remember that the serum hemoglobin is going to lag the shock state, so if the patient is actively bleeding with a normal-ish hemoglobin, the hemoglobin won't stay normal-ish for long without red blood cell transfusion. Consider invoking your institution's massive transfusion protocol in hemorrhagic shock. In distributive shock, IV access is important, and a large bore is favored when possible. A 30 milliliter per kilogram crystalloid bolus is standard, especially in sepsis. It's important to identify patients in anaphylactic shock quickly due to their chance of rapid decompensation from both cardiac and respiratory problems. These patients immediately need 0.3 milligrams of epinephrine subcutaneously. Treat everyone else as if they are septic initially, unless the patient has an acute spinal cord injury. 
Here, it's important for neurosurgery to be involved and probably just take over. Here, it is important for neurosurgery to be involved and probably just take over. Too much fluid can result in spinal cord swelling. Fluid resuscitation beyond 30 milliliters per kilogram is currently under study in septic shock and may be a bit controversial. This is probably as good a place as any to talk about vasopressors. High-level decisions need to be made with help from upper-level residents or subspecialty consultants. What you need to know about vasopressors is that they all cause constriction of the arteries, thus countering inappropriate vasodilation and distributive shock. Vasopressors have uses in other shock states as well. The key target for vasopressors is the alpha-1 adrenergic receptor, and selection of vasopressors sometimes depends on the effects at other receptors. The alpha-1 receptor causes vasoconstriction. You're almost never wrong starting with norepinephrine. It is a strong alpha-1 agonist and has modest activity at beta-1 and beta-2. Because of the beta-1 effect, it may augment cardiac output enough to offset the effect that the increased afterload imparted by alpha-1 activity has. It is considered first-line treatment in septic shock and may be the best for cardiogenic shock as well. There is no shock state in which it is contraindicated. Epinephrine is considered second line in septic shock. In addition to being a strong alpha-1 agonist, it is more potent at both beta receptors than is norepinephrine. Epinephrine is the drug of choice in anaphylactic shock. Its alpha-1 activity causes vasoconstriction and reduces swelling in critical areas like the upper and lower airways. Its beta-2 activity relaxes airway smooth muscle and reduces airflow limitation and wheezing. Beta-2 stimulation also reduces release of the inflammatory mediators that drive anaphylaxis from mast cells. Phenylephrine is pure alpha. It may be the drug of choice in neurogenic shock, but it can cause a reflex bradycardia. Some patients with neurogenic shock are bradycardic, and these patients might do better with epinephrine or norepinephrine. We sometimes exploit the reflex bradycardia of phenylephrine in patients with other shock states who are very tachycardic or who have tachydysrhythmias. Dopamine is a drug we rarely use, though it comes premixed and is stable at room temperature, so sometimes it's the thing that is most readily at hand. It has alpha-1 activity and also has activity at both beta-adrenergic receptors. It also has effects at dopaminergic receptors. I'm not going to say anything more about this drug here. Vasopressin is sometimes used as an adjunct in septic shock, though it can be used elsewhere as well. Sometimes we use it to manage blood pressure in patients fresh out from open heart surgery. It's important to obtain cultures and start antibiotics as soon as possible in septic shock. Delays in antibiotic therapy result in time-dependent increases in mortality rates. In general, when using multiple antibiotics, it's best to start with gram-negative coverage. If shock is not fully resolved with the initial fluid bolus, a central line should be placed and norepinephrine should be started. This may require placement of an arterial line to monitor blood pressure. The target mean arterial blood pressure should be above 65 millimeters of mercury. Neurogenic shock requires expert consultation early. In acute spinal cord injury, neurosurgery needs to be involved. Excessive fluids can cause the spinal cord to swell so earlier vasopressors like phenylephrine may be needed. Patients with brain injuries and older spinal injuries may also be septic, so continuing to look for and treat infection are a good idea. Neurogenic shock requires expert consultation early. In acute spinal cord injury, neurosurgery needs to be involved. Excessive fluids can cause the spinal cord to swell, so you may need to go to vasopressors like phenylephrine earlier. Patients with brain injuries and older spinal injuries may also be septic, so continuing to look for and treat infection are a good idea. Patients with toxic shock are almost universally septic, so the initial treatment paradigm should not be different. Patients with toxic shock are almost universally septic, so the initial treatment paradigm should not be different. If a bacterial toxin-mediated process is suspected, Clindamycin has theoretical benefit in shutting down the translation of toxin transcripts at the ribosomal level. Intravenous immunoglobulin has been used in severe cases of toxic shock syndrome, but data supporting this are thin at best. Adrenal insufficiency can lead to distributive shock, and the treatment is hydrocortisone, 
200 to 300 milligrams daily in either divided doses or by continuous infusion. The literature goes back and forth in septic shock. We know steroids at this type of dosing aren't harmful, but they don't reliably improve survival. My practice is to give patients in septic shock with escalating vasopressor requirements hydrocortisone. Cardiogenic shock is tricky, and early expert consultation is critical. If there's evidence of myocardial ischemia by ECG or troponin, oxygen, aspirin, and anticoagulation should be started. Patients in decompensated chronic heart failure are almost always volume overloaded. Because cardiogenic shock is a condition of decreased contractility, inotropes have a role early in its management to increase contractility. Volume status is variable in patients with cardiogenic shock due to acute myocardial infarction. Small boluses may be okay in the absence of pulmonary edema, but if the patient has pulmonary edema, fluid should be avoided. Consider the use of non-invasive ventilation with pulmonary edema as it has been shown to improve mortality. If you need to use a vasopressor, norepinephrine is probably your best bet. Of note, patients with cardiogenic shock due to progressive or decompensated heart failure are almost always volume overloaded, so you never want to give these patients fluid, and early diuresis may be your best bet. Again, it is critical that you work with your consultants. Pharmacologic hemodynamic support is tricky in cardiogenic shock, another reason why you need an expert to help you. Your options are vasopressors, inotropes, or both. Inotropes make sense. Cardiogenic shock is caused by a weak squeeze, so a drug that increases the squeeze hits that problem square between the eyes. Unfortunately, both dobutamine and milrinone are also vasodilators, so the blood pressure could drop. They also both increase myocardial oxygen demand, so in ischemic disease, they can worsen things. I favor dobutamine because it is shorter acting and may be less likely to worsen hypotension. Vasopressors will bring the blood pressure up, but they also increase afterload, which makes the failing ventricle work harder, also increasing oxygen demand. I favor norepinephrine and cardiogenic shock if I have to use a vasopressor. I don't go far without consulting my friends in cardiology, though. Extracardiac obstructive shock is generally stabilized with IV fluid. IV fluid increases preload, which helps counteract forces obstructing cardiac inflow in tension and tamponade physiology. In right ventricular failure due to pulmonary embolism, IV fluid increases preload, which helps counteract forces obstructing cardiac inflow in tension and tamponade physiology. In right ventricular failure due to pulmonary embolism, the right ventricle benefits from the additional preload. In obstructive shock, though, we are rapidly moving towards definitive interventions. With tension pneumothorax, needle decompression needs to happen immediately. Tamponade requires urgent decompression, ideally by interventional cardiology, but vasopressors and fluids can temporize. Treatment of shock due to massive pulmonary embolism is often multidisciplinary, depending on institution. Fluids and vasopressors can help temporize as well, as can inotropes. The key is relief of the obstruction, which can be accomplished using thrombolytics to dissolve the clot. In certain circumstances, though, mechanical techniques in interventional radiology or by open cardiac surgery are indicated.